thing. And then we enter into our winter break and we come back together on January 11th. That's Monday evening, January 11th. And we're going to take on the story of Noah and the flood. From there, we'll move on to Abraham, on to Isaac, on to Jacob, on to Joseph, stories that the book of Genesis tells us about them. And what we're trying to do in this course is try to take these stories, analyze them, and see what messages there are for ourselves. So we started last week with the story of Cain and Abel, and looking into the story of how each one was different. In their very name, we know they're different personalities. Cain was far more materialistic. He was a farmer by trade. That's what he did for a living. And Abel was far more spiritual, removed from the physicality of the world, and he was a shepherd, a career that allowed far more time for meditation. And these two brothers grow up, and we find a verse that tells us that the older one, Cain, brings an offering, and uh, he brings an offering of the fruit of the tree. Abel sees his brother bringing the offering. He too brings an offering. He brings from the firstborn and the fattest of his uh, animals. And God accepts the offering from Abel, does not accept it from Cain, and Cain is very hurt. He's very jealous. He's very angry. And God comes and gives him a therapy session and explains to him what it is that he's feeling and why he's feeling this way and what he can do about these feelings. And God uses the terms that you should, if you don't control this, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse for you. That sin crouches at the door. It's right there waiting for you. If you let it in, it'll continue to, to take power over you. And so you need to stand up to it. And you need to also know and understand and believe that you have the strength to overcome these feelings that you have right now. That's where we left off. And I left you in suspense as to what exactly was going to happen between these two brothers, between Cain and Abel, after this episode of The Offering. Well, the suspense is over. Hannah, if you could put text number six up on the screen. There we go. Text number six, Cain said to his brother Abel, period. Then, when they happened to be in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Okay, I hope it comes as absolutely no surprise to you. I hope by now you knew that story. But what is interesting about this verse is that there's something missing. It says, Cain said to his brother Abel, and then it's just a period. And then when they happened to be in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. What did he say to his brother? Said what? Why did he kill him? So what was the argument about that they had that Cain said to his brother? And the verse ends there. So the simple answer is there's no need to say because we all know what was happening here. Cain was looking for a fight. He was looking for an argument. And it would make no difference what anyone really said here. Cain was filled with rage and could not control it, even with the best of therapy and even with the best therapist, God. He was just so filled with rage and anger at his brother that his brother stole his show that it made no difference what the conversation was. It was what, it was, what was going on within him. And it's also, it, it, it proves to us the idea of free choice. Uh, you know, everyone that says that if God would come and speak to me personally, then I would believe and then I would be, I would practice and then I would do. It's not so, not so true. Here's God. He spoke to Cain. He told Cain not to do this, not to allow his anger to flare. And Cain decides not to listen to God. Text number seven. Some of the texts now that we're going to study is going to be about the conversation. He engaged him in argument and dispute in order to find a pretext to kill him. And so what the verse really is saying is he was looking for something to argue about. What he actually said was unimportant. Maybe it was a setup. Maybe it was able, I need to discuss something with you. And then he ambushed him. But there is a series, and I'm going to put them all up on the screen as we go through this evening, of Midrashic teachings. These Midrashic teachings are brought down in the oral tradition, and they seemingly discuss the context of the argument that took place in that vague verse. It's the seeds of the dispute. 
that led to the first murder. Now, I don't expect you to take these midrashic interpretations that we'll be putting up on the screen on face value. And as you will see what the Medrash is telling us, you'll see why it cannot necessarily be that they're to be taken literally. But what the Medrash is telling us, and what it does want us to accept, is the basis of their argument. What we find in these various Midrashic teachings is that they are discussing different types of arguments that the two types of brothers that we have in our story could be having. So what we see from the Medrash is they use this as a model to say, what type of arguments break out amongst people? What type of arguments, disputes break out amongst friends that can easily get out of control? And it wants us to learn from these models that it will put up, the Medrash will present to us, to be careful ourselves, to watch out, because disputes that start off seemingly as simple ones can rather get inflamed pretty, pretty quickly. And just like the story of the Garden of Eden and the story of the Tree of Knowledge, this story is more than just a historical story. And yes, it did happen. It was real. There were two individuals that lived. One's name was Cain. One's name was Abel. They did have a rivalry. They did have an argument. The story of the offerings is true. The story of God speaking to Cain is true. And the story of Cain murdering his brother Abel is true. What we're going to delve into is the possible reasons that this rage got so inflamed to the point that he took his brother's life because of it. So it's an important part of our history, of the history of the world, because it does demonstrate that man living with his fellow man was not going to be an easy task. So it's not just that God created a world and said, here it is, and it was all beautiful from there. It's going to be difficult putting different human beings in the same world with different personalities is not going to be an easy task because we're different and we rub each other the wrong way. And there's going to be disputes amongst people. How are we going to resolve it? Is it going to be a world that where it's the jungle, the whoever is the strongest will win? In the jungle, that's the way it works. Whichever animal has the ability to capture the other and eat it wins. Is that the way it's going to be amongst the human race? And in many cultures, it definitely was. But it wasn't the intention of God to have a world like a jungle called the Alam Gavar, which means whoever is strongest, survival of the fittest. So in the opening story, God does play for us the failure of the world, that one quarter of the world's population was wiped out in one dispute. And it begins this, this trend of evil behavior in this new world that will ultimately result in our next story, the story of Noah and the flood. But even more perhaps that we learn from this story is it defines character flaws. Now, when we talk about character flaws, it's something we all have. That doesn't mean we're going to rise up against our brother or sister and kill them. But we could recognize the weaknesses within us that we do have character flaws and that the Torah, through these stories, are warning us, keep them in check. So we're going to look at these different types of arguments that the Medrash says took place between Cain and Abel to ask ourselves, is that an argument that we can have? Do I see myself in that argument? And how can I possibly improve myself? And so the verse that leaves that vayomer vague, and Cain said to Abel, and it leaves a period, is doing that for a reason. It wants us to finish the sentence. What do you think, Cain said to Abel? And we finish the sentence by thinking ourselves, what could that argument have been about? Now, we have some background already on these two characters. We have these, the background that we discussed last week, the background of Cain, the background of Abel. To review briefly, Cain was materialistic. Cain wanted property. He gave to God, he brought an offering to God, 
but he did it as one gives a tax to the government. It wasn't with the heart. Cain, we also know from last week's class, struggles with jealousy, and he struggles with depression. The Torah told us that. The Torah also tells us he has a therapy session with God. And so, if any of us struggle with jealousy, depression, if any of us have a relationship with God in which it's not from the heart, but it's as a tax, I do it, God, because you're insisting on it, and you're stronger, and I need to rely on you, then the story rings a bell with us. Do we need that therapy session with God? Can we look into that therapy session and get something for ourselves from it? Because, yeah, I do have that sense of, of a sense of jealousy when I see others succeeding in areas that I'm not. And it does depress me when that happens. What do we know about Abel? Abel shunned materialistic possessions. He didn't follow his father's footsteps to go into the farming business. He went to take care of the sheep. The reason he did it was so that he could remove himself from the materialistic world as much as possible. He wasn't the first to bring an offering because he was involved all day in the offering of the heart. All day he was meditating about God. So he didn't think about this idea, let me bring something to God because all day he was involved in a relationship with God. But when he sees his brother doing something, he follows. He doesn't have the ego of his brother. I can't do it if my brother's doing it. He's perfectly content with following his brother if his brother is doing something right. Think about ourselves in, in, in this particular example. How do we react? Do we have to be the only one? Do we have to be the first? Or could we follow? Could we learn from others? Can we follow in others when they're doing something right? You also have another back part of the story that we discussed last week, and that is the background of what kind of world this story is playing out on. The time period of the story. It's the generation post-crisis. I say we can call it the generation of survivors. They live through a traumatic part of history, the expulsion from the Garden of Eden. They're experiencing now a new life in a new world. I would say it's a good possibility that they were being raised by parents that were depressed themselves. Adam and Eve perhaps felt they failed God. They were given one commandment. They failed. They faced the consequences directly from God, expulsion from the Garden of Eden, difficulty in farming, difficulty in raising children. So they're being raised in a home where parents feel like they perhaps failed or, or they're depressed parents, wishing they can turn the clock back, thinking about what a greater day it was before all of this happened, living with regrets, having an identity crisis. Children that are raised in a generation post-traumatic experience will have to deal with the aftermath. I think you know where I'm going with this. How many studies have been done in our generation about the children of Holocaust survivors? Make no mistake about it, we are affected by it. For good or for bad, it's a fact of reality. Those of us born to parents who experienced the Holocaust have paid a price for it. Again, it's good and bad. Good, I was raised by a father that had such solid faith, such emuna and betachen, such faith and belief in God, who was able to experience the horrors of a Holocaust and come out with his faith intact. Nothing can shake him for the rest of his life because that faith was so strong. He witnessed miracle after miracle after miracle for his own survival. Yet at the same time, there was always a part of him that was closed. There was always a part that you could not touch. That element of pain, of not seeing his father and his mother and his brother and sisters ever again after going off to a yeshiva somewhere 
and then a war breaking out and never seeing a member of his family again. That raw pain is something he had within him and as children, you feel it, you know it, you sense it and you can't touch it and you can't repair it. So we understand this idea of a story taking place on a part of history that's different than another part of history. This was a post-traumatic period of time. What about the survivors themselves? What kind of psychological baggage did they walk around with their entire lives? Their confusion, perhaps. How do you pick up the pieces and start again? How do you start a new life? So it's important to look at these two characters through the lenses of the time period they lived in. They each responded differently to the world events. And they responded based on their own characteristics. Cain threw himself into this new world by the sweat of your brow. Okay, you want sweat of your brow? I'll give it to you. You want work? You got it. And he follows the path of his body. What his body wanted is what he pursued. He understood that the consequences of the sin meant that we become materialistic. So let's be materialistic. Abel responds by saying, look how much trouble the body got us into. Look what happened to dad and mom when they follow the wills of the, their, of the desire of their body. So let's stay away from it. Let's only focus on the soul. Let's follow the soul. Let's withdraw from this world that caused this. So who was right? Was Cain right? Or was Abel right? And it's easy for you to say Abel was right because he's the one that lives, right? I mean, excuse me, he's the one that dies and Abel's the one that sins and does the murder. But was Abel really right? I say they were both wrong to some degree. Because perhaps what you have here is two extremists. No one looking for the middle ground. No one looking for the synthesis of the body and the soul. You see, where Abel is wrong is that the body is not bad that needs to be shunned. It's not all soul. We're not angels. We are soul within a body. It's not all body. It's not all soul. So this adjustment to this period of time of the expulsion from the Garden of Eden, this adjustment to this wedge that we spoke about two classes ago, to this newly felt dichotomy was not an easy one. And this first generation was having a very difficult time adjusting. With that in mind, let's read some of these Midrashic teachings that I was talking about. And I'll delve into them as we go along as to what do we think perhaps the Medrash is saying. So we'll start with text number eight. Cain said to Abel, so again, this is the Midrashic teaching us what was missing in that verse where it said, and Cain said to Abel, period, here is some opinions as to what he said. Cain said to Abel, I see that God does not conduct the world according to people's merits. There is favoritism in the way he conducts his affairs. For why was your offering accepted while mine was not? Abel responded to Cain, God does not conduct his affairs according to people's merits. God, excuse me, God does conduct his affairs according to people's merits, and he does not play favoritism. The reason my offering was accepted is because my offering came from a better quality than yours. So Cain said, there is no justice and no judge. There is no life world after this one. There's no reward. There's no punishment. Abel then said, you're wrong. There is justice, and there is a judge, and there is another life world after this one. There is reward for the righteous. There is retribution for the wicked. This is what they were arguing about. So we have this one opinion that basically says they were arguing about God. They were arguing about their understanding of God. Let's think about it. There are those who do not want to face their own failings and shortfalls. And they don't want to be corrected when they make their mistakes. And therefore, the easiest thing to do 
is to deny that there is any right or wrong in this world. And they just look at life as all about acquiring wealth in this world because I don't believe there is a heaven. I don't believe there's a place to go. I don't believe there's a judge. I don't believe there's a God that cares. Is there a God that really cares what I do? The world is about whoever acquires the most toys in this world wins. So stop this nonsense about a judge and about reward and about God's all seeing. This comes from this defense mechanism that refuses to take responsibility for your own shortfalls. So Cain, according to that argument, is basically saying to Abel, you know, if you believe in God, if there's a God of justice, it would never have happened that he accepted one and not the other. That's favoritism. And I can't accept a God that has favoritism. Instead of looking internally to say, what did I do wrong? Why didn't God accept my offering? No, instead, eh, there can't be a God. If there was a God, it wouldn't have worked out that way. Let's take a look at text number nine for another interpretation. Cain said to Abel, you said there is another world after this one? Okay, let us then divide between us. I'll take this world and you take the world to come. You really believe that there's a heaven to come after this. So let's divide it up. I keep this world, you keep heaven. Later on, Cain saw Abel grazing his sheep in a field. So Cain says to Abel, hey, didn't we agree on dividing the two worlds between us? Didn't the physical world, thank you, Hannah, fall under my ownership? Why are you grazing your sheep on my property? You can't graze sheep. Grazing sheep is, belongs to this world. This world is mine. You're in the heavenly world. Abel answered, had I known that my sheep couldn't even graze on the land, I would never have agreed to this. This led to the fight in which Cain killed Abel. Okay, another medrash, another teaching. What were they fighting about? They said, let's divide up the world. One took real estate, the other took the chattels. The one that took the real estate is, of course, Cain. And he says, the land you are standing on is mine. So the other said, what you're wearing is mine. Hey, if chattel belongs to me, you're wearing clothing that belongs to me. This one said, strip. The other said, fly. You can't stand on the ground because the ground belongs to me. And through this, it came and Cain rose up. And that's what led to the fight and one kills the other. Again, another strange teaching of the Medrash that tells us about the, the argument that they had. The reality is, is that the argument is wrong because you can't divide the worlds. You can't be only body, you can't be only soul. <clears throat> you can't say go fly because you belong in heaven. And the fact that you're not flying is because you live here on earth in a body on land. Cain needs to recognize that the clothing and the land, all of this, is part of this world together with the soul. Cain and Abel were, were, were too hung up on each one trying to find either materialistic or spiritual and not realizing that there's a middle ground, that there's a way to bring both together and live one life governed by your body and your soul, that your body and your soul are not at war with one another, but at peace with one another. Now, it's a struggle, it's a challenge, and everything in life is a challenge. But we can find that avenue. Let's look at another one, text number 10. What were they fighting about? One said, the temple will be built in my land. The other said, in my land it will be built. So says scripture, and it was when they were in the field, and field can refer to the temple, as Jeremiah states, Zion will be plowed over like a field. So this Opinion says they were actually having a fight. Where will the temple be built? In my land or in your land? In this Medrash, they're arguing about which lifestyle is more fitting for godly presence. Cain says, if God wants a presence in this world, it's going to be in my lifestyle because we have the wealth and we have the power. And that's where God will dwell. The acquisition of the materialistic. Now, before you dismiss this, understand that throughout most of history, this is what religion believed. They built these magnificent temples, right? Because they believed that God wanted the wealth. The whole idea of the Olympics really came from the idea of the fittest, of the strongest, of the mightiest Colosseums. This was all about that religion demanded 
there to be only the best and only the strongest and only the wealthiest. Sadly, how many even temples within our own faith is so much just about wealth, about who can be a member in this particular temple, about the status symbol of belonging to a particular temple. Well, this is a problem that plagues all religions, and it begins with Cain believing that his desire of materialistic is really a very spiritual desire, because we want to give God what he deserves, and that's only wealth. Or as Abel argues, the temple should be removed from any material value. And although he may be closer to correct, hey, the holy temple in Jerusalem also had gold and silver and copper and fine material. But what we were taught was is that it was a way of elevating the material to the spiritual and not remaining material. So we can use our wealth to serve God so long as we understand it's not just those with wealth that serve God. The individual in the times, let's see, I'm going to use example, in the days of the, of the Holy Temple, there were different types of offerings that could be brought. And the wealthy brought from their cattle, right? And the, those that didn't have that much, they were able to bring a bird. And those that didn't have any could bring a flower offering, all different types of offerings. The offering of the poor was just as valuable as the, as the offering of the rich and was treated with the same exact respect. But if the rich came along and they brought only flour and oil, even though they can afford something more, that would be showing disrespect to God. So it was you serve God with your best. And whatever your best may be, that's how you serve God. Cain and Abel were not able to find this commonplace. We, where is, we ask ourselves, where is your temple? How do you serve? Is it in the world of Cain that it can only be through power and it can only be through wealth? And that's my focus in life? Or is my temple in the camp of Abel? Where it's more about I'm Jewish in my heart, I'm Jewish in my soul. I live a very spiritual life. I'm removed from people. I'm removed from physicality. I'm removed from materialistic uh, possessions. Or some would say, I don't need to put on the tefillin because my tefillin is in my heart. I don't need to keep Shabbat because my Shabbat is deeper. It's more mystical because it's from the heart. Or is your temple somewhere that combines both material and spiritual? Is your religious belief and practice somewhere in the middle that combines both materialistic and spiritual? It brings them together in a beautiful harmony. So again, the Cain method is, it's all about the glory. It's all about the gold columns. It's about how big I can build my Colosseum, how big I can make my church, my mosque, my synagogue, how much beauty there can be, how much power it can have, the power of the church how much we can impose our will on others, that's what serving God is. Abel says, let's remove ourselves from this world. Let's just remove ourselves and just completely be the soul. And we have many religious groups that are out there as well, right? They hide in some desert somewhere. They eat very little. They sleep on the floor. They're serving God from the soul. So they don't need anything materialistic. What does Judaism say? Judaism says, find a way to bring them both together. Keep Shabbat. Keep the actual laws of Shabbat. And wear beautiful clothing on Shabbat. And have delicious food on Shabbat. And be in a nice home on Shabbat. And have your china and your crystal. But it's not all about the focus on the material. Use the material to elevate the day. To feel the Kedusha, to feel the holiness, to feel the tranquility of the day, to feel the beauty of the family, to feel the true blessings of family, of knowing what is ultimate in life, what is the true purpose in life. Material is something important in life, but it is a means to an end, not an end in itself. People always ask why the Hasidim wear those long black coats on Shabbat and holidays called the kapata. The kapata is actually a tuxedo from Europe because on Shabbat they wore a tuxedo. 
because it was an important day and they had the finest garments for that particular day. So you combine the materialistic and the spiritual together. Let's look at one other medrash on the subject of what they were fighting about. Text number 11. Rabbi Abuha said they were quarreling over the additional twin girl that was born with Abel. Cain said, I will take her because I'm the firstborn. Abel said, I will take her because she was born with me. What's that all about? I imagine by now you have figured out that the first generation of man were allowed incest in order for the world to continue. If there's only Adam and Eve, who do their children marry? So in that very first generation, and only that first generation, incest was allowed. Adam and Eve had daughters as well. It doesn't list all of their children in the Bible. It only lists the children that are important to the stories it wants to tell. And Cain and Abel were to marry their sisters and give birth to children. Now we can have cousins marrying. We no longer need to have brothers and sisters marrying. And thus it became part of the Noahide laws, a law against incest. This law was regarding a sibling of the same mother. The Medrash tells us that a twin sister was born to Cain, and two twin sisters were born to Abel. So Cain wanted the extra sister for himself. Hey, I want to. I'm the firstborn. Because if Abel gets her, then Cain's children would be dependent on Abel's children for marriage. But Abel's children would have a choice. They can either marry Cain's children or they can marry Abel's children. Others say it was simply about wanting another woman. They just said, hey, why should you get two? I want to. Now, all of these Midrashic teachings that we brought down, what we find really, if we look at them in totality, and this is why I say I'm not sure that these Midrashim are to be taken on face value. But what they're really telling us, what they're teaching us, is the roots of most of the arguments that take place in the world. Where do fights come from? Where do disputes come from amongst individuals, amongst family members, and amongst nations of the world? We fight over jealousy. We fight over property. We fight over religion. We fight over sexual wants and desires. And we fight over honor. I think it's safe to say in our period of time, we fight a lot over politics too, but we'll leave that for another discussion. And so all of these Midrashic teachings are really looking into what's the root of dispute in general. Let's utilize the story of Cain and Abel to try to understand human arguments. Text number 12, we'll do 12 and 13 together. Rabbi Eliezer HaKapper said, this is from Ethics of Our Fathers, envy, lust, and honor-seeking drive a man from the world. Text number 13, whoever possesses the following three characteristics is of the disciples of Abraham, our father, and the three opposite characteristics is of the disciples of the wicked Bilam. The disciples of our father Abraham possesses a good eye, a humble spirit, and a meek soul. The disciples of the wicked Bilam possesses an evil eye, an arrogant spirit, and a greedy soul. Humans must realize that while they must be mentally focused on the spiritual, the purpose lies in transforming the physical and uncovering its inner spiritual potential. Neither spiritual or material indulgence fulfills the vision of creation. If you're just going to be materialistic, you're not fulfilling God's mission. And if you're just going to be spiritual, you're also not. Think about this. Cain and Abel could have made a perfect team. Think about it. Each one complemented the other. 
Abel could have provided the spiritual focus, while Cain was skilled at working in the field, could prove the material resources for bringing spirituality into the material world. They could have worked so well together. A great partnership. Cain would provide, Abel would find the spiritual in, uh, value of everything. Instead, they chose separate paths, independent of the other, competing with one another, jealous of one another, each one wanting to be self-sufficient. And the result, civilization could not continue from either of them. We don't come forth from Cain and we don't come forth from Abel. We come forth from another son that's going to be born to Adam and Eve named Seth. So from Cain's desire of just materialistic and from Abel's desire of just spiritual, we end up with nothing. They're not our parents. They didn't bring the rest of the world behind them. Text number 14. So what happens now? Cain kills Abel. What happens next? God says to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? Right? And he said most famous lines. You've all heard these lines. I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? So God calls out to the world and he says, hey, hey, Cain, Cain, where are you? Cain, I don't see Abel. Where's Abel today? You see Abel lately? You know where he is? And what does Cain say? He doesn't say, ah, oh, he's dead. He doesn't say, I murdered him. He says, I don't know. And then he adds this line, am I my brother's keeper? It's a good line. It's a good question. It's a fair question. Am I my brother's keeper? I mean, we know what the Torah says to answer that. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, you're here to be a brother's keeper. But let's give Cain a, 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 a little bit here of, of, of the benefit in the sense of no one told him. He didn't know. So what's the simple interpretation of what's going on in this verse? Why is God asking, hey, where is Abel? God certainly knows where Abel is. The commentaries tell us he's using a simple question to engage in conversation. Cain is startled. Cain is scared. And so he wants to engage him in conversation. And so he starts with an easy question. Have you seen Abel? Cain thought to himself, hey, if he doesn't know where, he, where Abel is, maybe I can get away with this. Maybe the videotape was off at the moment, right? The surveillance camera went down. The battery went dead. But if you want to dig a bit deeper, perhaps we can say the question is more, not where is Abel, but look what happened to your brother. Look at your brother. To which Cain responds, I did not know. Not I don't know. I did not know. One of the defenses, if you were forced to be Cain's defense attorney, would be that Cain could say to us and to God, how was I supposed to know this whole idea of death? I was angry at my brother. I felt, I felt this desire to impose force on him, which I did. But how am I supposed to know that's going to result in something called death? No one died before. This is the first death of a human being. How is Cain to know that if I take a stone and I throw it at a head, that it can cause some type of either concussion or brain damage, which ultimately would cause death. How's he supposed to know? This never happened before. We know that if you take a stone or a brick and throw it on someone's head, you can kill them. We know if you take a knife and you stab in their heart, you can kill them. We know if you point a gun at someone, you can kill them. But if it never ever happened before, if no one ever died before, let alone be murdered, I do not know what happened to him. I don't know why he's not getting up. Is that possible hidden in his words? Text number 15. 
God said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is screaming to me from the ground. Now you are cursed by the ground that opened its mouth to take your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer give you of its strength. You shall become a vagrant and a wanderer on earth. So God is saying, you are responsible. And yes, you are your brother's keeper. Intentions came out of anger. Even if you want to claim that you did not know what you definitely wanted to do was use your physical force against your brother. That is something you claim you did want, but you didn't know the result would be. But guess what? You're responsible then. It was all from negativity. It was from anger. You wanted to cause him pain. We learn from the verse this, this human responsibility to pursue justice. The, the words that God says, your brother's blood calls out to me from the ground. It's such a powerful verse. We don't have the time tonight to get into this verse. But the idea that justice is something that will always be called for. The Torah will say that every murder needs to be, the murder needs to be investigated. You can't just say, we don't know who did it and close the file. The file must remain open and you have to pursue justice for a decade. You have to pursue for generations. You can never allow it to just be closed. Why? Because the blood of the victim will cry out from the ground for justice. The earth is upset, says God to Cain, that you used it for your acts. You hid the body of his blood-soaked body into the earth. So the earth is angry at you. And therefore the earth will seek revenge from you. Whereas by Adam, the earth was told not to produce naturally for him, that he'll have to put in effort. With Cain, it widens the gap between man and earth. It won't produce for you at all. You're going to have to survive by being a wanderer, by looking for sustenance, because the earth will never grow anything for you because you abused it. So God is saying to Cain, you are responsible. Let's take a look at text number 16, Cain's response to God. Cain says to God, is my iniquity too great to be forgiven? Is there such a thing as forgiveness? Can I be forgiven for this? Behold, you have banished me this day from the face of the earth, and I am to be hidden from your face. I am to be a vagrant and a wanderer in the world, and whoever finds me will kill me. Everyone's going to know who I am and what I did. They're all going to want to kill me. God said to him, indeed, whoever kills Cain will be punished seven times as much. So God lets it be known no one has a right to hurt him. God placed a mark on Cain so that whoever would find him would not kill him. Cain went out from before God's presence. He settled in the land of Nud to the east of Eden. Why was his life spared? Why not the death penalty? And the answer is one line of defense was that he did not know what the definition of death was. He did not know the definition of murder. He did not know the result of anything physical, of physical harm. There was no one to learn from, no one to teach him, and there was no law yet. No knowledge of the concept of death, and no law says that you can't do it. But he deserved punishment. Not the death penalty, because you wouldn't be able to win a case in first-degree murder. Put aside a case of insanity. A case of insanity would be based, for those of you that are attorneys out there, we can come up with an insanity plea. He did not know what this emotion of anger was all about. It was taking over him. He, he had no understanding of, of what this emotion was. See, when you don't have history, when you don't have anything in the background, you don't have prior generations to go to, we can come up with many defenses for Cain in our court case. But just because he would not be found guilty of murder does not mean he's not responsible, does not mean that he did not act sinfully. He deserved punishment. Why? 
because God just spoke to him earlier and warned him of consequences. God said to him, you're feeling angry? I'm warning you now, if you don't stop this emotion now, things are going to get out of whack and it's going to get a lot worse for you. And I'm promising you as your creator that you have the ability to shut it down. All you need to do is change that ego and learn the good stuff from your brother. He'll learn the good stuff from you and you'll be able to go on. It's because he did not listen to God's warning that he was punished. He had the free choice to overcome the anger. And he chose not to listen to it. And therefore, the death of Abel is his responsibility, although he would probably be found not guilty of the actual murder. Now, we do find a minor repentance here in his words. He says, is it too great to be, to, uh, of a sin to ask to be forgiven? It's an interesting thing that he does immediately ask about this idea of forgiveness. But he does seem immediately in the same verse to be more concerned about his own safety than forgiveness. What he's concerned about is the other humans on the earth that will know what I did, they're going to want to kill me. And therefore, can I be forgiven? What we don't find right away is the remorse of the loss of his brother. What we don't find right away is the remorse of the pain of his parents. He doesn't mention that. He simply talks about that the consequences are going to be too great for him. So God, can you help me out a little bit over here? And God says, okay, you're not going to die from this. I'm not going to let anyone harm you. But at the same time, there will be consequences. There has to be consequences. And the consequences will be that the earth will no longer provide for you. The earth will shut, shut its mouth for you. I'll close with one other commentary. Commentary says that this mark that God gave him to protect him, some say it was a mark on his forehead that basically meant hands off. God said he'll be protected. But there is another opinion, and I would be remiss if I didn't say it, that what God gave him, the mark that's being referred to, was a protective dog. That God gave him a dog and said, the dog will take care of you. The dog will protect you. The dog, you will be the master's dog and the dog will look after you. And just, uh, he'll take, take good care of you. I struggle with that medrash very, very much. I'm not a big fan of dogs. Not, nothing against your dogs. All you listen to me, you're right away getting defensive about your dog. You don't know. I was chased as a little kid by alley dogs all over Crown Heights. Wherever I went, they chased me. We spoke about this at other classes. Me and dogs do not get along. So anytime there's a complimentary medrash about the dog, I look at it and I say, ah, but I didn't know that dog. Maybe if I knew Kane's dog, I would think of things differently. I know what happens every time I speak about dogs. I get emails from you. I get pictures of dogs from you. You don't, well, if you met my dog, some of you actually bring your dog into my office and think that that's going to work. Please don't hold your dogs to yourself. Keep your dogs there. It's safer that way. COVID time, you don't want to have your dog come to my office anyway during the COVID season. Anyway, everybody, I want to wish every one of you a very, very happy Hanukkah, a safe Hanukkah. We have to celebrate Hanukkah. If it's going to be in your own homes, please celebrate it. Light that menorah. If you need a menorah, let us know. We'll get one shipped out to you right away. It should be a lichtika Hanukkah. And the lights of Hanukkah should permeate the darkness that we're in and end this pain that the world is experiencing. And let the miracle of Hanukkah this year be the miracle of the lights. And the light should overcome all the darkness that we are experiencing. It's been a pleasure teaching you the last few weeks. We're going to come back together January 11th. I'm sure we'll be sending you emails once again. And we're going to start with the story of Noah and the flood. All the best to you. Take care. I would say this. Ruff, ruff. Nah, I didn't say that. Goodbye. <laughs>